For 20 years, we've been creating innovation in the CX industry. And now we're seeking out brilliant new perspectives on CX you just won't find anywhere else. I'm Richard Owen. Welcome to the CX Iconoclast. Bob Cooper is an ISBM Distinguished Research Fellow at Pennsylvania State University's Smeal College of Business Administration, Professor Emeritus at McMaster University's DeGroote School of Business in Canada, and a Crawford Fellow of the Product Development and Management Association, PDMA. Bob's focus, as you can imagine, has been new product development, but what caught our eye was his recent peer-reviewed articles on the impact of artificial intelligence on new product development. As you can imagine, there are a lot of statistics thrown around by vendors indicating uptick in AI adoption, but most, if not all, lack any real basis in research. Bob, on the other hand, has published seven articles on AI in peer-reviewed journals over the 2023-2024 period, and it's a treasure trove of insights for any enterprise seeking to effectively apply AI technologies. Now, Bob is not new to the field of artificial intelligence. His new prod model was augmented and validated using machine learning and neural network analysis over 10 years ago, and was commercially available through his then firm StageGate International. More importantly, and more recently, he's been heavily engaged in research in the field of AI adoption for new product development by firms in both the USA and Germany, and looking at its impact on new product development performance. A couple of takeaways from today's conversation. First, many of the success stories in artificial intelligence don't really make the headlines. They show up in industrial applications, product development, back office automation. Your robo-taxi may not be quite ready for prime time, but step function improvements in engineering and business operations are quite real and quite measurable. Second, data showing homegrown AI solution failure rates should be sending up flares to leadership that are investing in AI projects through their own IT efforts. The critical factors behind AI success significantly favor off-the-shelf applications and reinforce the idea that your own internal initiatives are likely a very poor use of resources, resources that include time to market. This kind of development that many companies are still undertaking should in fact be the last resort. So perhaps the moral is beware of tool vendors selling you picks and shovels for your own gold mining expedition. Uh, well, Bob, thanks for joining us today. We really appreciate you taking the time to, to join the CX Iconoclast podcast. Thank you. Great to be here with you, Richard. So you're, you just shared in advance of publication, and I think you can probably share with everyone when it's anticipated coming out, uh, a recent article that you wrote, which, whose title is pretty self-explanatory, Why AI Projects Fail, Lessons from New Product Development. And, you know, it's a common, common stat quoted that very high percentages, maybe 80% of much of AI projects fail. Uh, perhaps we could just start by giving the highlights of that. If you were to summarize your, your key points from that article, what, what would you tell people? Okay, uh, Richard, the article's appearing. Uh, in fact, it's available online from the uh, publisher in the um, IEEE uh, magazine Engineering Management Review. I think if you Google that, you can find it. Um, the key points are that when we did the complete search on this, and not just not blogs, but research, you know, uh, checking out the research, the real stuff, the hard facts, um, we found that the, the, the about seven main reasons, and the top three, and they're almost tied, and and they're no surprise, is number one, the solution didn't work so well. It didn't work as expected. Well. Hello. I mean, a lot of people are buying uh, software from vendors that are being promised a lot of things by the salespeople. And guess what? Sometimes they don't deliver uh, either that or some other technical problems. Because shocked, the, shocked, I tell you. Shocked, shocked. Shocked, yeah. So there's a lot of expectations uh, being set by the marketing side of, of, of software companies. If you've gone online, I'm sure you've noticed that. Um, and, and, and so the product doesn't perform. There's also technical reasons for the product not performing too. But that, that, was, that was one of the top ones. Another one was data quality. And that's data both in terms of training, training and testing the model, in other words, setting it up, 
uh, especially if you're using a, a machine learning type of product that, that requires training. And, and also, uh, once in production or in operation, having bad data, garbage in, garbage out. And I guess one of the implications is, is that you need a real professional data scientist who understands uh, data sources, validity, reliability, merging data, and so on, and making sure it's clean and reliable. And the third reason in the top three is uh, they didn't understand the user needs. Uh, in other words, uh, they designed the product without really understanding what people wanted, or they bought a product without understanding what people wanted. So those are the top three. There's a few others down the list, but we can get into them if time permits. So, uh, you know, let, let, me, let me make a, perhaps a controversial statement. It might not be controversial for you. We, you might be in violent agreement. So in every technology wave, certainly I've been part of, Mm -hmm. The first vendors out of the gate are the people who sell the picks and shovels. They essentially say, here are the toolkits required. And we saw this with RDBMSs in the 1980s, and we saw this with web app development in the late 90s, early 2000s. And they come out of the gate with a technology set, and they sell it to corporations. And the message is, you know, you can do it. Here's, you, know, you can find gold in the hills. Here's the pick. Here's the shovel. Here's a pair of jeans go looking for it. And there's a lot of money made selling these kits to companies. But, but usually when we look back on these technology waves, they're rarely the applications that ever make it to full production. They're usually the ones that fail. Is that, is that, is that something you would agree with? Is that, a, is that a fair observation? I think that's a reasonable observation. I've certainly uh, observed that myself. Now, I don't have scientific fact to back that up, but, but as a casual observation, yeah. I mean, I, I can remember when laptops came out, going into the, into the shop with my wife, and they were saying, well, these are fantastic for keeping recipes. <laughs> okay, you know, and that was sort of about the only application they could understand. Well, that, that didn't sell too well, obviously. But, um, but you know, uh, you, you're quite right. Um, the, the problem is that, that I think in most waves, and, and, and really this wave is, is like many, it's going up and then going to come down a little bit, and then it's going to swing back up heavily. So we're sort of in a pre-wave of the main wave. And, and in the pre-wave, it's, it's, it's sort of a period of, of great uh, uh, speculation, of great enthusiasm, of great sales, salesmanship. Uh, and a lot of companies uh, are making money out of this. Obviously, the tech companies, the suppliers. In fact, there's a, a, a phrase going around, the only people making money out of this are the suppliers, not the users. So uh, we, we're sort of in that period of euphoria well, right well, that, now. That, that, that would seem to be true. I mean, if you look at the stack, NVIDIA certainly benefited enormously from the growth. You could argue that uh, AWS and Azure <laughs> have done really well. But, yeah. uh, but at the end of the day, the people who are supposed to be deploying it don't seem to have as yet seen the productivity. Of, there was actually a piece published by him by Goldman Sachs, largely looking at this from a, a stock market perspective and yeah. asking the yeah. question, well, if, if ultimately companies don't get enormous benefits, then there's a problem because all the capital investments in the technology aren't going to yield much yeah. if, if businesses can't get value. Well, you know, you make a very interesting point, Richard. Richard. Um, some companies are doing darn well. For example, I've, I've investigated companies like Nestle in Switzerland, in, in, you know, out of Lausanne. Uh, they are, according to their CTO, and I read a speech he gave at his uh, at, um, internal meeting recently, he claims that there is a 60% uh, increase in the pace of innovation at Nestle as a result of using AI. Everything from idea generation, concept generation, concept testing, uh, doing the scientific research on the liquids or the food products, etc., cetera, uh, mining their technical database. I mean, Lausanne is their headquarters. It's also their technical center. It's like a university there if you've ever been on their campus. Uh, enormous amount of, of knowledge that they're mining. Uh, GE in the United States is, is, is making claims that they can cut the design of a turbine for a turbine blades, one of the most tricky part, uh, trickiest parts of a turbine, a jet turbine, is down by fifty percent. Uh, you know, Renault just designed a new uh, automatic manual transmission. So that sounds like an oxymoron, but this is an automatic transmission that feels like a sports car, if you can believe, you know, using AI and did it in about a third of the time using Siemens software out of Germany. And Siemens is doing so some smart companies 
are getting it right uh, and really, really getting dramatic improvements. And these guys typically are the, the more clever companies, the ones with deeper pockets and the ones with good IT departments and a lot of good experience in terms of program management, you know, change management programs, etc. The average company is shooting themselves in the foot. <laughs> Yeah. And, yeah. and that's sad. That's really sad because it's obviously got to be mainstream. Well, and, and one of the points you made, which resonated very strongly with me, was this issue, and you, you mentioned it early on, was an inability to map it to ultimate objectives or needs. In other words, yeah. the tendency to think of this as a solution looking for a problem. And, um, you know, a lot of board level conversation has said, well, we're being told that AI, perhaps in particular generative AI, which in of itself could be a bit of a rat hole for companies, is going to be transformative for the economy. Heck, even the uh, former British Prime Minister, Tony Blair, has been advising that AI needs to transform the productivity of the entire economy of the United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. um, and so you better get about it as a board, right? You mm -hmm. better go off and find some things to apply generative AI to. And the tendency then is to rush off and, as you said, buy a bunch of technologies, put a team together and go and start building things without necessarily thinking through uh, at the end of the day, whether that's a smart idea or what the end point for all this is in terms of its business impact. And maybe that separates in no small part the average, as you describe, company, which is not getting much out of it. And the outliers who, in fact, approach this from a much more thoughtful perspective than, oh, we just got to do something because this is transformative. Right on, uh, Richard. Um, one of the phenomena we see is what uh, some experts have called the shiny things disease, uh, you know, where a technology push um, wave is often driven by, golly gee whiz, isn't this a neat technology? Where can we use it? solutions looking for problems and what is missing and by the way that when in the early days of product development and i was around in the early days that was the number one reason for new product failures that technical departments pushing technologies pushing solutions looking for problems that was the number one reason for new product failure now product developers over the last 30 40 years have gotten a little bit more intelligent and, and they've started doing something called voice of customer research and market research and understanding customers' pain points. These are very common to people of, of the next generation, but back in the, in the old days, they weren't. We're finding out you got to do the same thing in when it comes to AI installations. It's, it's not voice of customer now. It's called voice of process and voice of business. Voice of process is more uh, uh, metrics. Uh, that are f focused on the particular process that the AI will be installed in. And also voice of business means literally sitting down and interviewing potential users and understanding their concerns, their points of pain, what keeps them awake at night, and how you're going to have to make the product uh, in order to uh, satisfy their needs and keep them happy. I mean, if they're not happy, they're not going to use it, and you're going to have a, a you're going to have what is called pilot paralysis once you move into the pilot because it won't move past there. A lot of projects never move past the pilot because the users just push back. Voice of process, and, voice of business, two fairly simple solutions. Well, and and you know that sort of leads me on to another point you made here, which was unrealistic expectations. Um, and to some extent, it's the flip side of a coin, which is almost uh, hubris. You, you know, I think that companies start from a perspective, and, and I understand this, by the way, from the perspective of internal politics. If you're on a data science team or you're on an IT team today, it'd be good on your resume to have a whole bunch of IT projects, right? So your, your tendency is to say, you know, yes, we can do this. We can build this ourselves. We have the we have the knowledge, we have the in-house expertise. By the way, we also have, to your point earlier, we have a vendor here who's going to sell us some picks and shovels, and they are absolutely <laughs> confident there's gold in the hills, and there's no risk yes. of you not finding any. And so the expectations get tied to this almost hubristic approach that says, despite the odds, we're the ones that are going to beat it, yeah. and, a, and a good deal of self-interest and all gets put into overselling a capability, which is going to result in a lot of disappointment when more modest achievements might have been practical 
or frankly, the whole idea was was perhaps out of whack from the from the from the get go. Yeah, I, I think human behavior uh, is playing a, a major role here. Uh, I, I remember when I first started uh, investigating why so many projects in business fail to achieve their objectives. Uh, doing interviews in one large consumer products company in Ohio, uh, I won't mention their name, but they're in Cincinnati. Uh, <laughs> the, the, the expression I heard from one executive was, nobody ever got, a pr got promoted by having their project canceled. And so the name of the game is get your darn project approved. That means showcasing your project. So when you stand in front of management and are seeking the bucks to move, the, the dollars to move forward with it, obviously you paint your project in the best possible light. And to the extent the vendor has given you uh, ammunition to do this, so much the better. And so, of course, expectations are way overstated. Um, we found in, in traditional project management, like, like new product development, for example, uh, typically by a factor of about 2.5. In other words, people would promise, promise a million dollars benefit and actually deliver about 400,000. That was the average. And that's a, that's a pretty large uh, correction factor. I know what you're going to say, just divide by 2.5, but it doesn't quite work that way. <laughs> so it is yeah, an issue. It, and it's not, not just an AI. It's been true historically. Well, I was, I was going to say, I mean, this sounds, like, this sounds like the history of IT projects. But yes. But as you said earlier, you know, we're, we're going to go through a period of disappointment large and waste largely because of, I think, this lessons we've never learned from previous generations of technology, because there's nothing we're saying here today that you couldn't substitute for a whole series of technology, right, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. Um, and then we're going to see the success stories emerge. And to some extent, that's going to come from you know, best practices and standardization and people start to understand where the applications are, right? We were, we were home growing CRM systems 20 years ago and today you buy it off the shelf yeah. because at yeah. the end of the day, somebody solved all the hard problems already and we've learned how to do this. And, and surely we're going to go through the same curve again. I, I, I believe so. And I'm already starting to see glimmers of hope. I was doing some work uh, uh, with a, a, a military provider, uh, technical equipment, both military and commercial aircraft uh, components. And uh, they were saying, you know, they've been playing around with AI for the last two, three years, uh, largely no strategy, individuals in the company essentially getting a budget and going out and buying a piece of shiny software, uh, sort of, I guess, uh, a piecemeal basis rather than more of a big picture strategic overview. Now they've started doing two things. Number one, a more strategic point of view, probably needed, uh, looking at the whole organization or the whole RD&E function or whatever area you're trying to uh, introduce AI to. And the other thing they've started to do is they do have methodologies for doing projects involving technologies that have worked in the past. They're starting to apply some of those, modifying them, but starting to apply them because they do build in best practices and they do build in tough go kill decision points along the way and and there's a lot of tough go kill decision points in in, in an ai project obviously it's not just an automatic go from the get-go you know you start in and you may find out bad things part way along and have to pull the plug on it so those are tough decisions so they're starting to use that modified uh to suit uh, an internal ai project but but it is working they're saying and, and it's about time they said they're using it a good process, a good map. If you're going on a long journey, as he said, you need a map. And we didn't have a map. Yeah, we, and um, uh, you know, I'd, I'd like to pick up a couple of other points you made because I thought, by the way, I think it's a great article. Um, <clears throat> I think, a, a, to some degree, I think you'd, you'd you'd say it's a it's a summary of the existing research that's been out there, yes. but brought together, I think, in a really succinct way of looking at these challenges um and sort of it uh, should be required reading for anyone who's about to embark on some well, thank you, uh, some 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 home development exercise i think let's talk about talent because i i draw together a couple of your observations one of which was saying there's a tendency to put teams together that are highly technical data science machine learning ops it resources and lack any sense of domain and and if we think about it most good solutions are going to come from a combination of 
deep domain expertise, whether it's yes. you're trying to automate, as you said, look, you're trying to improve turbine efficiency. You're not telling me that no one on that team understands the engineering practicalities of building turbines, right? right? It's, it's, so you're, you're combining people with deep domain expertise with people who have the data science and uh, perhaps the, the, uh, the systems uh, and tools perspective to be successful. And yet so many projects seem to start with it's being originated out of a data science team. I wonder how much of that's the, the, the mythology that data science is this incredibly scarce resource and somehow it's all powerful. And we've, we've tried to deify a little bit data scientists and it's it's kind of led to an almost arrogance that says, you know, we can solve anything. And of course, that's a gross generalization, but it seems like where it goes wrong is when we overemphasize the data science and underemphasize the domain knowledge. Well, I'm I'm not going to comment too much on the arrogance of the IT department because I get into trouble there, obviously. But but that, this is not unusual. Again, the the, the article was entitled. Uh, why AI projects fail, lessons from product development. And product development has had the same problem. Whether it's AI people with a scientific, uh, uh, with a data science background, or a bunch of chemists at DuPont with a, a chemistry background, or a bunch of, of folks at, at, at Hewlett Packard in Palo Alto with a, a, a strong electrical engineering computing background. These guys are somewhat gods. I mean, Hewlett and Packard were gods. <laughs> And so, and, and Dr. Land, who started Polaroid, were, were godlike. And, 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 the tech, and, and, and they sort of run the projects and, and uh, to the detriment of the project itself. And, and, you know, the project leaders typically from that department, uh, most of the people on the project team are from that department. Um, and, and it's only been in the last at least in the field of innovation and product innovation, it's only been in the last 20 years that people have really been saying, put together a cross-functional team, including people from, uh, of course, the scientific part of the business, but also people from marketing, from production, et cetera. So you get different inputs because all of those people have to uh, be on board and have their input in order to make this thing work. So we're starting to learn that in AI projects too. It's not a new concept. It does work. And, and as I say, lessons from product development were, was part of the message of this article. This is not a new concept, but it does work. Did you see in your research any distinctions between companies who are focused on Let's, let's draw a distinction B2B versus B2C or more complex products because the examples you gave of success in some ways were uh, heavily engineering-centered companies yeah. that, have, that have solved product problems um, for complex products often, right? But is there, is there anything we can learn from looking at this through the lens of consumer markets versus business markets? Obviously, you're associated with ISBM. Um, an organization I've had a lot of dealings with in the past and is a bit of a rare animal in that it focuses so much on B2B. Um, any thoughts on that? Well, um, first of all, I, I am an engineer by training. Um, and uh, although I'm part of this ISBM Institute for the Study of Business Markets, a lot of my work over the years has been with consumer goods companies, including the one I just referred to a few minutes ago yep. from Cincinnati. And, and a number of others like that, Unilever in the UK, uh, et cetera. Um, Sherwin-Williams Paint in the US, Paint ICI in the UK, also Paint, et cetera. Um, some of these companies, of course, are B2B and B2C. It, it is true that the WOW applications uh, seem to be more of an engineering, mechanical engineering, electrical engineering type of design products. Uh, that, of course, could include some consumer products, such as technical products, uh, you know, an iPhone or, or, or electronic device. Uh, but if you're thinking about food products and uh, consumer packaged goods in the grocery store, uh, not quite as much. Uh, the biggest, we've we done another study, Richard, uh, also through ISBM. We also did it in Ireland and we did it in Germany. And the interesting thing is that the Applications, we looked at about uh, 20 applications in the new product process from generating good ideas all the way down to uh, the pre-launch product, the, the pre product test to make sure they really work 
before you know we we go to market and and the and the and the, the, the tasks that were ai enabled that had the strongest impact on key kpis like acceleration productivity better decision making we're all in the middle of the process, design, engineering, prototype building, prototype testing, uh, virtual twins, for example, or digital twins, uh, simulations. They seem to have the highest financial impact. Idea generation, yeah, that's good, but it doesn't seem to have quite the, the dollar impact uh, or putting together a good business case using AI. You know, the AI will help you build a business case. AI will help you design the launch of the product. Do the pricing, the advertising, etc. But those don't have quite the same dramatic impact that the ones more in the middle of the process, the development and testing phases. And and so logically, you gravitate a little bit more away from, sorry, towards an engineering company like a Siemens and a bit away from a beer company like Guinness. Mm. Because I, I can't quite see, you know, <laughs> it's, it's a little harder to do AI for a Guinness type product. You know, it's so. So, if you think about the, po the 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 current conception in the marketplace, almost all of it is consumer application, right? Mm -hmm. The the most exciting thing, arguably, to happen, um, which you know has caught the attention of the market, certainly, mm -hmm. has been generative, and the most obviously cited use cases around generative are often personal use, creative, mm -hmm. and so we've we've got this public narrative that AIs going to transform the world and it ranges anywhere from Elon Musk's robo taxis and self-driving yep, cars, yep. all these very visible elements. And yet there's an argument that that's all sort of for show. It's mm. created a lot of attention, but the money's being made by the quiet application of these technologies to solving complex problems that are often engineering related or product related or the back office or automation and productivity within the enterprise. And that disconnect, by the way, might also start to be showing up in the in the stock market because that's that's a lot slower to take shape. <laughs> so there's sort of um, I know there's a golfing term, drive for show and putt for dough. No, I, 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 Morris, who's an good. active golfer, will we'll have more of a viewpoint on that. But yeah, are, are we are we are we doing that now with AI? Are what? we driving a lot for well, show? Well, you know, you 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 ask good questions. Let me tell, let me put that to you. This this is an interesting issue because we have debated amongst ourselves groups of people that i've i've given seminars with about whether ai is going to be found more in the product or behind the scenes developing the product because ai can be used in both ways let me give you an example uh i mentioned guinness uh guinness is a company i worked with for many many years i had a great time uh, 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 flying into dublin all the time st james's gate etc <laughs> <laughs> Lovely a dream, city. A dream, a dream client, for sure. It, 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 you know, they have a tap, in it, or had at the time a tap, a beer tap in every meeting room. <laughs> that sounds perfectly, perfectly very, reasonable to me. Very civilized. In any event, uh, in an industry like that, a process industry, whether it's food and beverage or chemical industry or, or whatever, uh, you can use AI uh, a lot of the way along. For example, AI has been used very heavily in the pharmaceutical industry and to uh, a, a almost as great an extent in the chemical industry to come up with new molecules, new molecules that do this or that. BASF in, 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 in Frederikshaven is doing quite a bit of that in Germany, coming up with AI to come up literally with new molecules. Um, but they're also using AI to come up with new ideas for a new product. I mean, if you don't believe me, just sit down and say, I am looking for a new beer idea. Just talk to your AI, to your chat, a new beer idea that is healthy, does not have a lot of alcohol in it, but sounds a lot of fun to drink. Can you give me some ideas for what I should develop or brew? And it'll come up with some really good ideas. So idea generation, concept generation, testing, um, putting together the launch plan, doing the Marcom, marketing communications. Yeah. but. Now, how do we build AI into beer? I mean, I can't really picture a pint of Guinness with little computer chips floating around in it telling me, drink now, it's at the right temperature, <laughs> right? Uh, and that's the way we sort of think about AI in the product. And some of the products, of course, are silly, like Procter & Gamble's new toothbrush. 
that tells you it's a smart toothbrush, AI built in. I guess it tells you whether you're brushing your teeth correctly. <laughs> so well, there, there's lots of but examples There's a, there's like a term that. for that, by the way. They call it AI washing, the tendency <laughs> to, you know, take your, your vacuum cleaner and label it as AI-enabled vacuum cleaner. Uh, or your toothbrush. So. Dyson, Dyson has one out. The UK company, it it it, it identifies a, a, allergens, I think they're called, and and deliberately sucks these up. And, <laughs> and you wouldn't bet against James Dyson actually managed to incorporate AI into a into a vacuum cleaner and, and, Nike, and double the price and, for it and sell it to people. There you so go. And maybe and that's Nike, the exception. And Nike's another one. They have shoes that apparently lace themselves to the right level of tension, so you'll be a more effective I'm a little basketball more player. I'm a, I'm a little more <laughs> suspicious about that one. <laughs> so is, is AI going to manifest itself more in the product or behind the scenes in the development of the product? And I think in, in certain industries, like more mechanical, electrical industries, it's probably more behind the scenes, although... Right now, I think the balance is about 50-50. That, that, that's what the folks are saying. It's going to shift more to the product as people figure out. Now, I use the example of, of, of beer. It's hard to imagine AI in a beer until you start thinking, how about one of those labels? Uh, what is it? They call it an RF, RIF tag um, that, that, that maybe when you're sitting in the, in the pub drinking beer out of a bottle, for example, uh, it, it'll allow you to play games on your iPhone or something or have a, an interesting uh, challenge question for your other or, or uh, and, 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 and nightmarish view of the future, a dystopian future. <laughs> uh, but that's possible, you know. I'm, I'm not sure it's too interesting, um, but possible. That sounds extremely plausible to me. Um, Bob, we're kind of coming up against time. I, I okay. wanted to sort of leave, leave on one theme here, which was despite all this, I mean, it sounds to some degree as though you're still an optimist here, that this is a natural process that companies are going to go through mm -hmm. and are going to emerge the other side and we'll figure this out and we'll move out of the sandbox phases into more mature development processes. Yes. Is, that, is that a fair characterization of where you came out on this? I think so. Uh, if you get it right, uh, the benefits are significant. Some companies have modeled the way to show that is true. As I said, these early adopters with the deep pockets and, the, and, and, and know how to do things right. Uh, for the rest of us, the great majority of us, it's a matter of getting it right. And so many mistakes are being made at the moment. Uh, and interestingly enough, Richard, uh, there was a Harvard Business Review article. They actually used the phrase, dumb reasons for failure in the title. Because most of them are very dumb reasons that can be avoided with a little bit of best practices built in. What, what has happened to the editors at Harvard Business Review? I'm, I'm <laughs> I couldn't believe shocked, I tell you. That, that they actually put that word dumb in the <laughs> it's, title. It's, <laughs> but, <laughs> it's gone to hell, obviously. Yeah, but, but, and that's basically what my article was outlining. Here are the reasons, guys. They're all actionable. People have solved them before in other contexts learn from how they did it before yes. and apply it to your particular endeavor. <clears throat> so, so I am very optimistic. The benefits are there if you get it right. The key is getting it right. Well, and, and I think that sometimes, um, you know, when I read your piece, the thing that struck me was, again, there wasn't anything there, which I think you looked at and said, okay, this is revelationary, but it's yeah. a really great way of pulling these points together mm -hmm. and backing them up, as I said, with the research, the hard research, as you said earlier, yeah. uh, in, in a form which I think makes it a very compelling and, and straightforward read. So congratulations on that. Bob Cooper, thank you very much indeed for joining us today. Really enjoyed it. And uh, good luck with getting more visibility, uh, especially to the piece. Hopefully people watching this will... We'll pick it up and read it and get some benefit from it. Well, thank you, Richard, for uh, allowing me the opportunity. And I wish everybody who's attempting to move forward on this journey, this AI journey, farewell, literally, do well. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening to the CX Iconoclast from OCX Cognition. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts so you won't miss any of our thought-provoking conversations. And please get in touch if you want to learn more about what OCX Cognition's predictive CX analytics platform can do for your business by providing complete insights into every account, continuously updated and connected to operations. You'll find contact info in the show notes.